Hello, and welcome to today's Doer Author Program. My name is Teresa Mons, Young Adult Librarian at the Westchester Loyola Village Branch. And I am here today with my colleague, Nicholas Clayton, Adult Librarian from the International Language Department at the Los Angeles Public Library. Before we move forward with today's program, we would like to pay our respects and acknowledge the Gapiomeno, Songva peoples as traditional caretakers of this land. Because it's on this land that we are so lucky to work, teach, and learn as a community. It is our pleasure to host the Your Author Series today. Please feel free to use the chat box to communicate your thoughts, comments, and questions throughout the program. Also, don't forget to email ECDEP, pardon me, ECDEPT at LAPL.org to be entered in an opportunity drawing to win a copy of today's book, Cuba in My Pocket by, by Ad, um, Ad, um, Adriana Cuevas. Today, in today's Your Author program, Adriana will discuss her book, Cuba in My Pocket. Adriana's work has been nominated for a Pura del Pre Award, and she's a former Spanish teacher. When she's not helping students or wrangling her pets, which include a axolotl, she practices fencing with her son and works on her next novel. We want to thank our generous donors, the Lenore S. and Bernard A. Greenberg Fund and the Library Foundation and our behind the scenes staff for helping the library bring these amazing author and illustrator programs. And now what we've all been waiting for, welcome Adriana. Hello, hi everyone. Thank you so much Adriana for taking time to be here with us today. It is wonderful to have you here so we can get to know more about you, your creative process and your work with Cuba in my pocket. Thank you, I'm really happy to be here. So we don't see a lot of books written by Cuban American authors. What was it like to write about your Cuban heritage? I think for me and for a lot of authors from underrepresented cultures, uh, at times the perception is that we are deliberately shoving our culture into uh, the book. And for me, I found that it's actually the opposite. The other, um, thing that authors tend to work off of is that adage that you write what you know. Well, I know about being Cuban American. It's who I am. So naturally, the characters that I create, the situations that I create are going to come <clears throat> from that culture. But for me, I didn't realize that um, I was going to have to explain things. I think because this is who I am and what I know, at times you don't realize that it's not exactly a frame of reference that everyone has. And so they have perceptions of your culture that are not accurate. Uh, I put a ton of Cuban food in my book, one, because I'm just obsessed with food in general and I love Cuban food, but people have perceptions of food from Latinx cultures that doesn't actually fit Cuban food. Like it's not spicy. And so um, I found that I had to explain things more than I thought I would originally when I started writing, um, only to dispel some of those um, preconceived notions that people had of Cuban culture and the fact that some people just knew nothing about it. So uh, yeah, there was a lot more explanation involved than I was prepared for, but it was really just because I was writing what I know, I was writing who I am. So naturally that was gonna be in all my stories. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Um, so can you tell us a little bit more about yourself and your novel, Cuba? Sure, absolutely. So I grew up in Miami, Florida um, and I lived there until college. Uh, but I always wanted to be a writer, but it took me a while to get here. Uh, I was a teacher for 16 years before I became an author and Cuba in my pocket is my second book. Um, and it's one that I actually wrote while I was waiting. There's a ton of waiting involved in publishing. And I actually wrote Cuba in my pocket while I was waiting to hear back from all this stuff for the total eclipse of Nestor Lopez, which was my debut. Um, and it stemmed from a small scene actually in the total eclipse of Nestor Lopez. There's a scene where Nestor, the main character comes home from school and he's complaining to his abuelita about this terrible day he's had and how she doesn't understand how difficult it is for him to always move around a ton because he's a military kid. And so she tells him essentially her immigration story that when she was 14, she was sent by herself from Cuba to the United States. She didn't know any English. She didn't know anyone. And she had to learn how to start over. And I took that from my father's uh, immigration 
story. Uh, that's what inspired that scene. But I realized after I wrote that scene, I didn't want to leave my, my dad's entire legacy, his whole childhood, just to one small scene in a book that has talking animals. Uh, I wanted to give it its, its due. And so after that, I, I started researching and uh, writing Cuba in my pocket. I interviewed my dad a ton. I interviewed a lot of cousins about their experiences. Um, and I'm very glad that I did because one of the things that kind of drives me as an author is preserving my history, preserving my family and my culture. And I do that through my stories. And I definitely did that with Cube in my pocket since I was preserving my dad's childhood experiences. And that became really, really important because my dad actually passed away in November of 2020. And so now I have this record of his life uh, that I think really proves what I had felt all along, that our stories are there to preserve the things that are important to us. And so that's what Cube in My Pocket is uh, for me. It was a journey to get here, uh, but it's a book that I'm very, very thankful to have written. I'm so sorry about your dad. Thank you. It is such a wonderful thing to pass on our parents' stories and their parents. I think that we should all do that, you know. Maybe not in a novel, but, you know, just yeah. you know, reform or something. <laughs> no, but it's true because one of my absolute favorite quotes, I always share it when I do school visits with students, is a Sandra Cisneros quote where she said, write what should not be forgotten. And I just love that quote because I realized like that's what I do. Even if I'm telling a story, like I said, with Nestor Lopez that has witches and talking animals and a bunch of nonsense, like I still used that book to document what it was like for me when my husband was deployed uh, in the army overseas. Like that was how I remembered that time. And then Cuba in my pocket, you know, that's how I remember my dad. And so, yeah, it's that quote is like one of my absolute favorites because that's really, I think what drives me as an author, I'm writing the things that I don't want to forget. And I'm a forgetful person. So I have a lot of writing to do. And it's great that your dad shared his story. So. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> yes. I'm correct. Like the, the memory of the family and keeping mm -hmm. that memory alive is so important and being able to write that down. And um, one of the things also is with that memory is you do a great job of showing how the refugee experience of separation, of loss and isolation mm -hmm. when, when they resettle in a new country and how important it is to feel a sense of, of belonging. Can you tell us a little bit about as a, as a first generation American, do you, do you feel, or did you ever feel different or like you didn't belong? I will say that growing up Cuban American in Miami, Florida is definitely a privileged thing. Um, my culture was all around me. I could walk into Publix and get pastelitos and medianoches whenever I wanted. There are tons of Cuban restaurants. My music is on the radio. Spanish is spoken everywhere. So I will say that I did not feel out of place at all growing up. It wasn't until I went to college in the Midwest. It was my first experience and it was almost a slap in the face because it was such a shock to me. I didn't know that, that this happened. Uh, I was walking on campus and I would sit in my classes and realize like I'm the only Latinx person in this whole class. Whereas when I graduated from high school, I think we had three white kids in our whole, you know, graduating class. It was the opposite. I had never been a minority. I was always the majority in Miami. And it was an odd, it was a very odd experience um, because all of a sudden I realized people were treating me as something different. Um, and it was all these small microaggressions that I, they were ones that, you know, you don't realize it at the time, but when you think back on interactions you've had, you have with people, you're wondering why they said a particular thing or why they treated you a certain way. Um, and all of a sudden I was apparently this encyclopedia of all things Cuban. I was supposed to know everything and represent everything. And that, you know, I'm, Yes, I am Cuban. I am incredibly proud of being Cuban. I love being Cuban, but I'm not just Cuban. I am a lot more things uh, than that. But I had never been viewed as only Cuban until I uh, lived in the Midwest and all of a sudden my culture was non-existent. It was nowhere. Um, and so I think that was a, an experience I tried to translate into the book 
with Kumba where he does feel like he's being treated like this encyclopedia of, of Cubanness. He calls himself the Cuban ambassador um, because that's, we often hold, when I was an ESL teacher, oftentimes my kids were kind of held up as these examples of, oh, this is what it's like to be Vietnamese. This is what it's like to be, you know, from China or from El Salvador. And, you know, that's not really fair. Kids are more than just that. And yeah, but no, moving to the Midwest, that was my, my first uh, rather foul experience with that sort of thing. You kind of actually answered the next question that we had um, about not messing up and being racist stereotypes. Um, and why was that such an important aspect of your book? Yeah. That actually, like the whole showing that where Kumba feels like he's not allowed to make mistakes because it'll reflect poorly on all Cubans around the world. Um, that was something that I drew from in my experience as an ESL teacher, because that that would happen to my students all the time. You know, we it was this small town in Southwest Missouri, and most of the people in the school had never met someone from the countries where my students were from. And so it was like their behavior was emblematic of everyone from that country. And that's not fair to do to a 14 year old, um, but that's what kept happening to them. And they, they would just have these big emotions about ma making mistakes or their behavior. And I mean, that's a, that's a huge burden for an adolescent. Being an adolescent is hard enough. You don't need to add this pressure of, of being an ambassador for your country. <laughs> yeah, I love that. Cause I, I mean, I can, totally relate because he was the only he and um, his friend or the yes, only, or the only two Cubans in the whole school and I can totally relate to that because I was the only one in my whole school and I yeah like, and I know that a lot of people can you know a lot of immigrants or not even immigrants just people of color can relate to being the only one and being the representative I, I yeah that's it. <laughs> thank you Correct. And the other thing that was interesting is in the book when um, when Akumba sees his friend, he says, hey, you're here. And there's that moment where they connect. Mm -hmm. And I feel that there's a lot of a lot of cases where that happens in daily life with people when they find somebody from their hometown or their old school and they're far away from that. And it's such a unique connection and it brings that brings them kind of into the present, but it also mm -hmm. says, hey, it's all right. You know, we're here and we'll and we'll and we will make it through and we will survive and we will do well uh, because we have each other. So it's a very yeah. strong message. Yeah, I could because I think it's important to see that, <clears throat> you know, up until that point, I mean he had in the book he has, you know, Alejandro and Valeria that he lived with in Miami. And they provided a certain anchor to his new home. And I think Serapio does that too when he, you know, Kumba moves to the Keys and lives there. It's that just like you were saying, Nicholas, it, you're looking for something that grounds you. You know, before he's just aimless and, and, and wandering, he doesn't belong anywhere. But finding someone, someone that you can connect with, that you have something in common with, something that's important to you um, and that you have in common with is so uh, you know, that is essential, I think, to creating a new home, to learning to live in a new place. Uh, so I definitely wanted to portray that um, in, in the book. And so, I, yeah, I tried to do that with a lot of the secondary characters. I feel like we do that even when we travel. You're in California. Oh, absolutely. You're, in California. You're looking for anything familiar, anything that feels normal to you. Yeah. Especially when it's another country and another language and another culture Yeah, to where I can recall my relatives telling me similar stories. Mm -hmm. They traveled somewhere and they saw their friend or they saw somebody, said, you won't believe who I saw down there. And it just was like the years vanished and I was able to talk to them again. So mm -hmm. when, when that part of the, in that part of the book, I could see many of of, of the people in my family, but many other people um, connecting like that. And mm -hmm. it was really nice. Very, it's a very powerful scene. Um, the other, the other thing about the book, which is very powerful is it talks about the generation that came here 
you are on father's generation. And your father was one of more than 14,000 unaccompanied children who were sent by their parents from Cuba to Miami in the early 1960s. And a lot of them wrote letters home. Um, did you use, did, um, to because those letters are, are amazing in terms of their, um, how they describe what's happening and how they evolve, moving to schools, moving to another house, um, getting established, writing about what they see. Did you use any of your family's letters for the for the book, or how did you create those letters for the characters in the book? Those are actually purely from my imagination, um, because when so like when my my tío and my abuelitos came over, I obviously they couldn't bring anything with them. So they're not they didn't bring letters, you know, that my dad would have sent. So any letters that he sent um, home while he was here by himself are gone. Um, and then my dad's not a very sentimental person. So he never kept any of the letters that were sent to him um, from like his brother. Uh, and so. I, I made them up, but my dad was actually the fact checker for the book. After I would finish writing a chapter, I would send it to him because I knew that I was fictionalizing parts of his life to because I needed to make a good story. Um, my dad is, is typical of a lot of, I think, older immigrants where when you ask them about their experiences, like I would say to him, you know, dad, you were here by yourself. You didn't know if you were ever going to see your family again. How did that feel? And he would look at me and just shrug and go, well, it was all right. I'm like, no, dad, I am trying to write a story with lots of tension and drama. You, you've got to give me something else. So since I was fictionalizing some parts of his story, I wanted to make sure that I was still being true to his experiences. And so after I would write each chapter, I would send it to him and he would read it, give me thumbs up or say, you know, this isn't, he He had more of an eye for detail than I did. And so he would correct some of the historical inaccuracies that maybe I had put in. Um, but he liked the letters because he he said that, yes, they stayed true to this, this you know, spirit of the letters that were exchanged between um, he and his brother while they were gone. Cause they didn't get to write each other very much at all. Um, but when they did, yeah, he said it, it kind of, it did stay true to that spirit. So I'm glad that I accomplished that at least. Did he, um, uh, did he get to read the whole book? Yes, no, he did. Um, he, he got to read, the book had already gone through copy edits. So he got to read the whole book. He actually got to see the cover art, uh, the final cover art. And so that made me really happy too. Um, because when, when he was in the hospital, he showed the cover to like every doctor, every nurse, like everyone in there knew my daughter's an author and she's published, she wrote a book about me. And it was just very neat to see him react that way. That's beautiful. He looked yeah. 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 So good. yeah. <laughs> Who is your favorite character to write? So I, I always joke with my editor that if I could write a book that only had secondary characters, I would, because I've realized like those are my absolute favorite characters to write. Um, and I think it's because you don't feel so burdened by creating this like strong character arc that you typically have to take a main character through. And I realized the secondary characters for Cube in My Pocket, like I said, I had to there are a lot of characters that are based on real people in my dad's life. And then there are others that I added. And I realized the ones that I added are people that I had hoped my father had in his life at that time. So like Alejandro and Valeria, yes, there were other children that were living in the house that my dad lived in when he first came to Miami, but he didn't tell me very much about them. So I just kind of created these, these two characters but I made them who I hoped my dad had. I hoped that he kind of had an older brother figure like Alejandro to kind of guide him or a motherly figure like Valeria to take care of him. Um, when Kumba goes to his first school and he meets, you know, uh, Arnold that becomes his friend, I hoped he had a kid like that when he went to school that defended him and supported him. And so I realized that that was kind of the function of the secondary characters in the book. So I think my favorites... I really enjoyed writing Arnold and I will give you kind of a, I guess it's an Easter egg. Arnold is actually based on my maternal grandfather, my mother's dad. His name was Arnold. 
super horse racing enthusiast, just like the Arnold in the book. Um, and so I just kind of took my grandfather and made him a 14 year old boy in junior high. Um, and so that was fun to do. I really enjoyed writing that. And then I, I really enjoyed writing uh, Serapio. Those, the friends that my dad had in Cuba are all actually based on this group of friends he had growing up. They all came to the US and they all actually reunited later. Um, that was one part that I kind of fudged. They didn't meet up right after my dad had immigrated. They actually met very much later in life. Again, they reunited. Um, but he was fun to write because I do like writing um, side characters that kind of interject a bit of humor into some tense situations. And there are a lot of tense emotional situations in the book. And so I kind of use Serapio and Arnold um, to give a little bit of lightness to those. That's fine. Those are my two favorite characters. <laughs> yeah, I love that. Like, I need help with my math. And then there's like, ah. Yeah. <laughs> um, what, who, who is the hardest? Honestly, Kumba. I mean, this was based on a real person and, and a real person that is like my hero and I care very much about and I didn't want to screw it up. Um, so creating an interesting character for a reader, um, someone you're going to want to follow along on a journey, but at the same time being true to my dad and who he is, there was that tension um, that I really felt like a lot of times I didn't feel like I was up to the task of of writing the book. And so that, I think that was one of the reasons why I kept having him read my chapters um, because I wanted to make sure I got it right. Uh, I'm used to just creating whole human beings in my mind and getting to put them down on paper and it doesn't matter what they do or what they say. I can make them do whatever I want. Um, but yeah, the challenge of having my main character be somebody so close to me whose life I was trying to accurately represent I don't know that I'll write another historical fiction based on anybody connected to me. Yeah, that must have been a lot of pressure. I it know. was. The, uh, but the, the characters, all the characters around him are so amazing. Like his, even his foster parents. Mm -hmm. that, are those based on real people? Or? Yes, absolutely. Um, yeah, so so said, yeah. Yeah, Prima Benita that he stayed with in Miami was my actual cousin, um, Norca Fejo. And um, he actually got to see her on her, I think it was her 93rd birthday. He flew out many, many years later uh, to San Antonio and, and went to her birthday and got to reconnect with her. And then the foster family that he stayed with um, in the Keys he actually was able to reconnect with them um, much later in life. Their younger son, who was now like my age, uh, you know, he got to um, meet them again. And when he found out I was writing this book, when I told him, hey, dad, I'm writing a book about you. He actually reconnected with them another time to say, hey, you know, this is happening and I want to send you the book uh, when it comes out. And so it was nice to see my dad. I think this book encouraged him to connect with people uh, that had been a part of his journey. And so that was really a, kind of a nice thing for me to see. Yeah, it's amazing to have that because to be able to, to be in that position to, to write the family, uh, the family story in a way to mm -hmm. take part of the story and to write it, but also the pressure of that to where you're checking everything. And in that whole process of, you know, being able to talk to the person to make sure everything is correct and what a gift that is because mm -hmm. a lot of people don't have that opportunity sometimes maybe you know time goes by or they don't right. get the opportunity to do so so it's amazing when that when that happens and to put it all together in this book it's amazing um mm -hmm. when i was reading it i stopped many times and i had to pause because I could say I can feel the emotion. I can, yeah. I can, I can, I can feel something here that's very profound. Mm -hmm. um, that in other historical fiction, let's say that I've read was very interesting. But you know, there's moments like, for example, well, the one I'm going to mention right now is the one where I kind of stopped in my tracks, if you will, as mm -hmm. I heard echoes of this growing up. Mm -hmm. Is when um, we have. Gumba and Serapio, and they're in the boat, and they play that AFDF game 
in, in between themselves, not a game, but it's kind of like they're talking amongst themselves. Mm -hmm. It's like therapy in a way. They're trying to make sense of the world yeah. and their kids. So they're trying, trying to view it from, from that position. And what's fascinating is that character says that before you know, they didn't feel so helpless, but now, and then there's a deafening silence. <laughs> yeah. And they both know that they feel helpless in a way because they're mm -hmm. in between they're not with their family somebody just told them this is your family mm -hmm. and they're like uh no mm -hmm. no it's not my family my family is somewhere else mm -hmm. um and that 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 was amazing that part of that part of the book in particular um what was the um does that tie into anything in particular that you heard a story about or maybe relatives spoke about that yeah no absolutely i think i was like you were you kind of you know as a kid sitting around the dinner table you hear different things and, and opinions being um expressed and then when i i would talk to, i talked to my dad about this and he he conveyed to me that when he first came to the u.s and i kind of addressed this in the scenes that are in cuba when kumba's talking to his abuelo his abuelo basically tells him look you're just going to the U.S. for a few months. We just need to keep you safe. You're going to go to the U.S. We'll figure out everything here at home, clean it up, and then you can come back. And I feel like that was the opinion of a lot, the thought of a lot of these poor kids that were being sent by themselves. Look, I only have to survive just for a little bit, and then I can go back home. I can see my family. I can go back home. And then my dad told me, he said, you know, we stayed a little bit longer. We stayed a little bit longer and things didn't get better. Things didn't get better. And we realized this is it. We can't go home. You know, what is even home now? Is that home? I don't get to go back there or is it, or is where I am now home. And so there's and you got to figure these are all children that are having these huge emotions and thoughts about this. And so to put this in a book for young people and to try to convey what that experience was like, that was why I created that game that they play of antes de Fidel y después de Fidel, you know, so that they could compare what their life was like, what they thought their life was going to be like and what it ended up. And so, yeah, for Serapio, that moment to him is his realization that this is it. He doesn't get to go home. You know, the people that he left there, that's it. Um, and so that kind of finality, when my dad was, he didn't get to bring anything with him, but he has his passport. In the author's note of the book, that picture, you know, is his passport photo. And I scanned it. And when I was looking through his passport, one of the things that made the biggest impact on me is he has a stamp in there that after he had been interviewed by immigration and they realized that, you know, okay, he this kid shouldn't go back to Cuba. They stamped it with something that says indefinite voluntary leave. And that word indefinite just, yeah, it stuck with me. <laughs> like as a kid, what must that have been like to read that and know that that means forever? Um, and so, yeah, it was, you take all these like big emotions and big things and realize but I'm writing this for, you know, a kid my own son's age. And, and how do I make this comprehensible and digestible to them? And so I think that's one of the big challenges that kid lit authors have uh, of, of taking these huge issues and, and distilling them in ways that young people can relate to it. Because I think a lot of kids with their their changing world and, and what they have to deal with, even though this is historical fiction, I feel like there's still so many emotions like that that they can can relate to of not feeling like you have a grasp on the world around you or like that you're tethered uh, to anything. Mm -hmm. Yes, and that's um, throughout as that was th there was many examples to where I, I froze when I read the book because I read I'm like, oh, boy. That was that was quite powerful because um, there's it's 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 multi layered. There's a lot of depth in what's happening, and just that you know that stamp. I mean, how would a mm -hmm. kid understand that? I yeah, mean, especially if you're like, what does this mean? It's you right. know, it's, 
and then you'd have to go to an adult and ask, you know, mm -hmm. what does this mean? And then and the adult might not even know. Yeah. They might have to look it up or they may have to go to an office yeah. or something. So, yeah, that's, yeah, the, the power of memory mm -hmm. and imagery and how it sticks in your head um, is amazing. And there were so many amazing times in this book where that was just, it was, it, it kind of jumped, jumped off the page, if you will. <laughs> Like, I know that's, that's been said oftentimes, but in my case, I saw it jumping off the page. Like, wait a minute, there's something really interesting happening here. Mm -hmm. It's not just like two levels deep. It's like five levels <laughs> deep. And it's, you know, it, it links to all these people, mm -hmm. you know, and yeah. so. And that was honestly something I, I tried not to think about too much as I was writing, because like we've said, you know, I, I had that pressure of writing my dad. I tried not to think about the pressure of writing the Cuban experience, writing the Cuban immigrant experience, writing the experiences of all those Pedro Pan kids that came at the same time. I, I had to shut that out because I think I would have absolutely frozen and never written a, a word. Because like we've been saying, when your culture is not widely represented in something, that means each piece of representation that does exist is all that more important and the pressure to get it right is all that more important and so i thought if if i feel if i put on myself that this is going to be the tome of you know a young person's cuban immigration i i would have frozen and we would not have the book that we do today no nick told me i was gonna cry and i did at oh no <laughs> at the reference desk and there was one scene that in particular that I had to stop reading and it was um, when he goes to school and he doesn't speak any English. And that was my experience. So I was yeah. like, oh, I can't read this. And But it's not just a Cuban experience. So it's just mm -hmm. the immigrant experience, which is I think why so many people could relate to this. Yeah, <laughs> so, so much of the scenes of him being in class with teachers that first scene when he's in history class and his teacher is just terrible and ignoring him, my the impact that that teacher had on my dad, that I wrote that person straight from my dad's memory. He remembered that teacher 50, 50 60 years later because of how terrible that person was. Um, and then in a lot of the other scenes with teachers, I drew from my own experience as an ESL teacher of seeing how various educators would interact with my kids um, because it's such a unique experience for students when not only are you trying to learn the same thing as everyone else, but then you have that added layer of language and culture. Um, yeah, and so I really felt like I wanted to show that so that regardless of whether you were interested in Cuban immigration, interested in this historical period, if you were an educator interested in knowing more about what that experience is like for English language learners. I wanted to really convey that as well as I could. No, oh, that's wonderful because I've, I've actually even seen it visiting because I'm a teen librarian, visiting mm -hmm. schools and seeing kids sitting in class all quiet. And then you realize, oh, they don't even speak English. Yeah. And here they are. I mean, it's crazy. Mm -hmm. Okay, so another, uh, the domino, the, ro the double eight, um, I know he holds on to that and then lets it go. What can you tell us more about all this very specific reference? <laughs> so it's it's a double nine and in like double Cuban nine. dominoes, they call it the Caja de Muertos. And so it starts out like that's what opens the book. You know, this, this scene where a soldier barges into the house and threatens them when he leaves, Kumba flips over the domino and it's the double nine. And so he keeps it because like all good Cubans, he's a bit pessimistic and cynical as we know. Um, and he keeps it in his pocket this whole time because for him, it's a symbol of bad luck. He is gonna assume the worst is going to happen um, at all times. And I will say that is an accurate representation of my dad's personality that I had actually a, a little bit of fun putting in there because we would give him a hard time about how pessimistic he was. Um, but the, the domino evolves over time, I think, for him that, yes, he thinks it represents bad luck. But to me, I felt like the reason that he still hung on to it was that this was something from home. You know, he didn't get to take anything with him. He had a couple of changes of clothes 
the security at the airport, the soldiers at the airport stole everything else. And so this domino is it. So even though, yes, it does represent bad luck to him, it's that connection to home. And, and it's the one last thing that he has uh, um, that reminds him of that place. And so, yeah, I think it does evolve. And I don't want to say what he does with it at the end, because it's I don't want to give that away. But I, I, that was one of the scenes I think I cried the most while I wrote it. <laughs> Should we take questions from the audience? It looks like there's a lot of questions. And should we keep going? Next. Um, well, let's see if you like. Yeah. Um, sure. Yeah, that sounds good. Excellent. So let's see here. All right. So, OK, let me see here. I'm looking at some questions here on the right side of my screen. If you see me looking, that's where I'm looking for the <laughs> questions. All right, so let's see here. Okay, um, so oh, we have a question from Diane. It says, do you miss teaching? Um, so I'll be honest and specific. I miss working with students. I do not miss all of the other things that tend to go with the teaching profession. Um, I taught Spanish and ESL and it some point in the 16 years that I taught, I taught kindergarten through 12th grade. Um, don't miss teaching kindergarten at all. Um, but the reason I write middle grade is that I, that was my favorite age of kid to teach. Absolutely love those kids because they're still young enough to be silly and have fun. And yet they have this like emerging sense of justice and, and wanting to do what's right and wanting to care about like fairness. Um, and I adore that, that those two things exist together. And I loved teaching those kids. Um, but I don't miss like, I was, <laughs> I didn't like having to be the disciplinarian. I just wanted to talk to my kids about stories. I wanted to, you know, it was, it was hard to be in charge. <laughs> Right. So that's, that's interesting because middle school is not everybody's favorite age. <laughs> oh, no. We always used to joke like it takes a special deranged person to enjoy middle school. And I'm that person. I love those kids. They are a tornado of hormones and a mess. And I adore it. I adore it. That's why I love writing those characters. You can't have a boring character if you're writing a middle school kid. They are not boring people. All right. Um, okay. So, um, so Teresa, do you want to take the next question? Okay. So I see Steve puts in there. Uh, how did yeah. you, how did you feel when you, when your previous book was named a Buddha birthday honor book? Oh, I, I burst into tears. Uh, no shame at all in that. I really did. Um, because I will be honest with you, the total eclipse of Nestor Lopez to me, it, I told myself, this isn't the type of book that wins awards. Like the literary books, those are the ones that win awards. This book has talking animals and fart jokes in it. It's not a, it's not going to win an award. So I told myself that, like, don't worry about it. Enjoy award season. I was rooting for all my friends. It was fine. Um, but then my phone rang and I hate talking on the phone with a passion at all. Uh, and so I ignored it. And it rang again, ignored it again, rang, ignored it. Finally, I get this voicemail that's, you know, hi, this is so-and-so from the American Library Association. You really need to pick up your phone. <laughs> and so they, uh, they called and told me and I hung up and proceeded to cry. And my husband and my son thought that someone like something terrible had happened. <laughs> and so, yeah, no, it was amazing because I loved that, particularly the, the books that they selected for the honor books, my book, and then Lupe Wong Won't Dance by Donna Barra Higuera. That was another one that Donna even has even said, like, we didn't think that these are the award books. Her book, the first line talks about having a wedgie. And so I love that, you know, we're give, we're showing that fun books, adventurous books uh, are still valuable. And so it really, I was incredibly thrilled. <laughs> 
That must have been an amazing message to get. Please answer the phone. Oh, it was hilarious. Like I screenshot the the transcription of the voicemail and sent it to some of my friends because he was like, yes, please pick up your phone. <laughs> so let's see, we have a question here from Patricia who says, has your family read the book? If so, what were their reactions? And what was the mo what was most moving about seeing them read it? So they they have um, so my mom and my dad read it before it was published because, like I said, like my dad was my fact checker, and then after it went through copy edits, I actually had my mom and my dad read it again because I asked them to point out like any anachronisms that I had had because like I had a character that was saying "What's up?" in the hallway, and my dad was like, "We didn't say that in the 1960s," and so I was having them point out things like that. Um, and then like my, my sister and, and so all my family has read it and it's very interesting to see their perceptions to it in relation to their relationship with my dad. My son loved reading it because he got, he was getting to learn more about his abuelito and his life. Um, and I put like some family jokes in there that only my family members will understand. Um, and so it's been fun to see them find those and react to them. Like um, Kumba's mother is when she forces water on him, like, and he has to drink glass after glass of water. And it doesn't matter if he has a headache, stomach ache, if he's bleeding profusely, her, her cure for everything is a glass of water. That was my abuelita. And so it was, putting those little family tidbits in there was fun, but no, my absolute favorite reaction was definitely my dad because his, his reaction to the book was actually one of, of disbelief. He couldn't believe that someone wrote a book about his life because his perception of himself was, I'm just this ordinary person. Why would anyone write a book about me? But it was because we don't, we tend not to view ourselves the same way that other people see us. My dad didn't, know that like I see him totally different he's my hero you know and so I'm obviously going to think he's worthy of a book um but he yeah his his reaction to the book was actually disbelief more than anything like I I can't believe you did this now I uh, my sister and I joke that I was just merely trying to claim the title of favorite child and I feel like I've done that <laughs> but yeah no it's been a lot of fun and very satisfying to see everyone's reactions to it Patricia also asked um, if your book's going to be available in other languages. Oh, yes, absolutely. I am so excited. Actually, both of them, The Total Eclipse of Nestor Lopez and Cube in My Pocket, will be available in Spanish um, later next year in 2022. And I'm very excited to see them translated. Um, I'm, I'm a language nerd. My master's degree is in linguistics. And if I had my way, my books would be translated in all languages. But definitely Spanish. So I'm very excited to see the Spanish editions. Awesome. Do you get to choose who's if your translator is or? Um, yeah. Uh, the person who's translating it is a man, a Cuban man named Alexis Rome. Um, and so he's working on that uh, right now, actually. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. And then it looks like Joseph has a, uh, what, what's your favorite, what's the favorite, your favorite part about the job? Oh, favorite part of being an author? Yeah. Um, for me, actually, uh, so I'm always thinking in pictures and stories. I have a very short attention span. I get distracted very easily. I have ADHD. And so uh, my favorite part of being an author is that the fact that my brain is wired differently, um, I found is actually an asset to my job rather than something that would make my job uh, difficult or me bad at my job. Um, because I'm always, uh, thinking up new things. I tend not to filter my creativity, which is essential for an author. You don't want to censor yourself when you're trying to come up with ideas. And I have practically zero filter between here and here. So, um, that's an asset. And, um, it just helps me be imaginative that way. And for me, since I'm always telling myself stories in my head anyways, I get to feel like a productive person by writing all those stories down. And so I think my favorite part is seeing the the fruition of making all of this stuff up in my head and then seeing it down on paper and 
and getting people to react the same way that I do to those stories. Um, it's just very satisfying. It's very satisfying. We have, let's see. Oh, um, we have a question from Celia who says, how do you get into the zone when you're writing? Do you have any snacks you must have when you're writing? Now the snacks you have to be very particular about. So I cannot handwrite anything. My handwriting is terrible because my brain works faster than my hand can write. And it's very frustrating for me. So I type everything. So my snacks have to be clean enough that I'm like, like I would eat pastelitos de guayaba every time I write, but you know, my keyboard would be a super mess. Um, so yeah, I tend to snack on, I've, I've recently become obsessed with this variety box from my Korean grocery store of chips. So that's what I tend to eat to get in the zone. Um, like you said, because I, I have ADHD there, I've learned that there's specific things I need to do to help me focus. So my writing process doesn't look like another author's, which is not going to look like it. We all use different processes just based on how our brains work and what helps us work best. So for me, um, I actually used to write while watching television. Um, the reason for that is that I have to have visual stimulation as well as auditory stimulation while I'm writing. Because if I write in silence, my brain is going to work overtime to fill up all that lack of stimulation and I'm not going to be able to focus. But it has to be noise that I'm controlling. Like there are a lot of authors that will go, you know, write in the library or write in a bookstore or a cafe. I can't do that because I'm not controlling the, the stimuli around me and it, I would still get distracted. So I put something on the TV that I've seen before seen many, many times before. So I don't really have to pay too close attention to it, but it's just so I need different visual stimulations. So I have to be able to look away from my computer for about five seconds at a time, reset my visual stimulation, look back and continue writing. But then COVID happened and we were all home to keep everybody safe. So my husband and son were home with me and I couldn't exactly commandeer the TV the whole time. Um, so I actually had to train my brain to just listen to music while I was writing. And I literally mean train. It took me several tries to finally get used to writing that way because I had to adjust. Um, and so now that's what works for me. Visual stimulation is still best, but if I have to write listening to music, I, I can and that's okay. And I know there are a lot of writers that will curate playlists that you know, mirror the emotions of a chapter or the feel they're trying to get in this section of their book and they'll make sure all these songs fit. Um, I don't do that. I write my super Cuban stories while listening to K-pop. So um, I don't need like specific playlists. <laughs> I love that. Later to ask, have you tr tried watching music videos? <laughs> no, that would be too distracting, particularly with the music that I like, because I'd sing along like, it, no, no, no. It has to be something I've seen before. Like, so for Total Clips of Nestor Lopez, I watched uh, Supernatural for like the millionth time because I've seen it a ton before. And I will say it kind of fits the vibes of the book. Um, but for Cube in My Pocket, I actually watched The Office again and again and again, um, because that was something that, like I said, I've seen and I don't have to pay close attention to but I can still kind of look away every so often. I get that. <laughs> <laughs> right. Do you want to so I'm scanning for some questions here. Make sure I'm not missing any questions here. That, that's a good one. What advice would you give to aspiring young writers of color? Uh -huh. Oh, excellent. Um, so first, for any writer, I always like when I do school visits, I tell kids that if you're looking to improve your writing, read as much as you possibly can. I do that one because I love stories, but I know that reading is part of my writing process. If I take a step away from my manuscript I'm working on so that I can read several books that I've been wanting to, I don't consider that you know, procrastinating or not doing what I should be. That's part of my writing process because as I read, I pay attention to the things that I like in how the story is being told and equally important, the things that I don't like in how the story is being told. So I always instruct kids to kind of be aware as you're reading of how this story is, is being told and how you're reacting to it. Do you like it? Do you not? 
that would be my first piece of advice for particularly young authors of color. I would say that you have to tell the story that you want to tell, regardless of any pushback that you get. And what I mean by that is there are going to be people that don't understand your way of storytelling. Um, and you still have to tell your story how you want. For The Total Eclipse of Nestor Lopez, after I wrote it, when we sent it to various publishers, I actually kept getting rejections from publishers who were saying, we want this to just be a story about a kid whose dad is in the military. We don't want this magic part. Because what I felt like they didn't really realize is that in so much of Latinx culture, magic is woven in it's a part of who we are it's not something that like exists separate and is this you know special thing that i'm going to add in it's integrated and so i couldn't tell this story without it um that's my the one of the reasons why writing historical fiction was so difficult for me was because i really kept wanting to add some fantasy to it some magic to it um and so i would say you really have to stay true to the story you want to tell, even though there are going to be publishing is super white and there are going to be people that don't understand the story that you're telling because they don't understand your culture and they don't understand who you are, but you will find that person who does. My editor that I do have, Trisha de Guzman at Macmillan, um, she is from the Philippines. She got it. She got what I was trying to do with that story and the incorporation of magic because it's the same in her culture. And so it took me finding somebody where I love working with her because I don't feel like I have to explain myself all the time. She gets it. She gets who I am. And so as a young writer, find those people that you can collaborate with who get your writing and get who you are and share things with them and work together um, because it really is a team effort. And there's so much rejection in writing that you've got to, got to have a support team around you to, to survive, really. Yeah. And so is your next project gonna be magical? Really? No, it is. I'm totally back on my regular, yes. No, I was like, I love you, dad, but wow, this is it. Um, no, my, my next book, I actually got to announce it uh, last month. It's called The Ghosts of Rancho Espanto. Um, and so it's very similar. It's a contemporary fantasy like Nestor Lopez. And it's about a bo young boy named uh, Rafa who steals the slushy machine from his school cafeteria. And as punishment, he is sent to work at a ranch in New Mexico that may or may not be haunted. Um, and I, I think writing that book, I told my editor when I turned it into her that it was the most fun I'd had writing in a long time. Like I had a blast writing that book. And so I cannot wait uh, for people to read it. It's super Cuban and I adore it. <laughs> Yay. I look forward to that. I'm going to turn the light on in here because it's getting dark. But I'll be right back. <laughs> okay. Now you can see my kitchen. There you go. <laughs> All right, Nick. All right. So um, what I'll do is now we have some questions for you here, which are a different type of format. All right, so what I'll do is I'll take the first one and then Teresa, can you take the next one? Yes. All right, what is your favorite word? Uh, my favorite word in English is logaria. It literally means diarrhea of the mouth um, for people who talk too much. And I just think it's so perfectly descriptive. And yeah, that's definitely my favorite English word. My favorite Spanish word is ombligo just because I like how it sounds. <laughs> It means belly button for whoever doesn't speak Spanish. Okay. Arroz con frijoles o moros? Arroz con frijoles, because like, um, con gris too dry. It's too dry. Like, you got to put all the black bean juice on the arroz con frijoles. So, just so people who don't know, rice, one is rice and beans, separate, and the other. <laughs> <laughs> one is rice and beans, and the other is rice and beans. <laughs> When you cook together, when you, yeah. you separate them. <laughs> All right. What's your favorite Cuban sandwich? Oh, medianoche. I love those. I could every day. That was one of the things that uh, 
Like once I left Miami, I had to teach myself how to cook Cuban food because I couldn't get it anywhere else. If I was going to eat it, I had to learn to make it myself. And like a medianoche was one of the things I used to make a ton. They, they are very good. Yeah, <laughs> I like all. Oh, okay, uh, favorite painting or work of art? So uh, I had to... Um, look up when I knew y'all were going to ask that because I remembered what painting, but I couldn't remember who painted it. But I love um, Christina's World by Andrew Wyeth. There's this woman and she's laying in the grass and she's looking back at this house. And the reason that I like it is that there is a story in that painting, like in terms of art telling a story. But what I love about it is that it could actually be any story. Like you could interpret what's going on in this painting in so many different ways. And so that's what I, I love about that one particular piece of art. All right. Um, flowers or plants? Oh, I'm going to kill both. So neither. <laughs> Good answer. I know. No, 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 no. <laughs> Okay, uh, pastelitos de guayaba con queso or just de guayaba? Just de guayaba because I love the flavor of guayaba. I don't want it to like have to compete with anything else. Yeah, yeah just pura guayaba. <laughs> All right, this one I, I thought of. It's actually, it's not here, but it's very similar. Do you use leche evaporada con café or do you not use leche evaporada con café? I don't use leche. Mm -mm. Are you drinking black? Yes, sin leche. <laughs> so that was I like, need like the full test. <laughs> that's a very Cuban thing. It's to put evaporated milk. Right. <laughs> or, or evaporated or condensed. Isn't it condensed? I don't know. My mom used to put condensed milk. Okay. Yeah, my abuelita used to do condensed. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Very, very sweet. Mm -hmm. Okay, so because we're almost out of time here. Observatories or aquariums? Oh, aquariums. Um, my son given his obsession with animals that he had, I've been to more zoos and aquariums in the United States than I ever thought I would go to. All right. Favorite mood booster song? Um, okay. So I was telling everybody here that I actually went to the BTS concert in SoFi Stadium last weekend. So <laughs> my mood booster songs tend to be BTS songs. There's so many you could pick. So I will just stick with that. <laughs> Okay, the last one is apples or oranges. Oh, neither. I. That's healthy food. I'm not going to eat fruit. I'm going to eat pastelito oh, instead. Potatoes. <laughs> yes, no. <laughs> All right, well, thank you so much, Abina. Yes, thank you. thank you. It was very, very nice talking to you. Yeah, thank you. This was wonderful. I really appreciated you having me here. Thank you again. Um, yes, thank you so much. Book. It's available at the library. <laughs> so thank you all for oh, Adriana okay. remember to visit lapl.org to find more amazing books and remember to join us uh, for our next Your Author program on Friday, December 10th at 4pm when we chat and uh, with children's author Lynn Risling as she discusses her board book A is for Acorn Finally, our winter reading challenge is right around the corner. Join the winter reading challenge and let a book charm, intrigue, or transport you. Register and track your progress online or on the Bean Stack app, or pick up the game board at any Los Angeles Public Library location. Um, complete five activities and be entered into a drawing to win a prize from the library store. This reading challenge will start next Monday, actually, December 6th, and go on until January 8th, 2022. Until next time, we really, truly appreciate all your support. The success of all of our library programs could not happen without viewers like you. So thank you. Yes, and thank you to all of you as well. And have a wonderful day.